if, if I tell you, let's think of something that, um, let's use a child maybe. If Caleb, when he's young, and I tell him, tell you what, this Saturday, man, it's been hot out here, but it's supposed to be a, a cool front come through. We're going to go to the zoo this Saturday. Okay? And, or I tell him maybe even two weeks ahead. We're going to go to the zoo here in a couple weeks. That's what I'd like to do. So let's say Caleb a few days later, he makes a request. Now you said you were going to take me to the zoo. So I just want you to know I want to go to the zoo. So I'm asking you to do what you told me you would do. Take me to the zoo. And I say to him, yes, sir. I told you that's what I wanted to do. And I'm going to do that. Does he need to ask me again? Why? So we've been talking about this subject that um, it's, it's something that I used to study a lot. I was in a Pentecostal church growing up and then a church which was type of church which was called Word of Faith, Word of Faith. And those are some things, uh, there are lots of things about the Word of Faith church that I believe are very unscriptural and Jesus-like. So I left that particular type of church. But there are some things about it and things that I was taught, things that I learned, especially after my mother was healed of cancer. You don't have to believe she was healed, perfectly fine. But the doctors told her after two bouts with cancer, you have six months to live, it's all through your lungs and your lymph nodes, get everything in order, you're going to die. And she didn't die until about 31 years later. So that's all the proof I have, take it or leave it. But there are certain things that she learned at that time, and then I began to learn after seeing her example. And, um, but because of the other weirdness and things that I just think are out of order about that particular stream of the church, I sort of left some of the good things behind. Sort of threw out the baby with the bathwater. And um, one reason is people sort of get upset when you begin to talk about some of these things. And so you can get upset if you would like. I don't want you to be upset, but I want to share them anyway. And so when it comes to praying, when it comes to I need this or I want this, there are certain principles that Jesus taught. And that's, where I, that's what I'm about. Here's what Jesus said about it. And I'll give supporting things for that. And then you can take it or leave it. You can ask questions. You can ponder it, which is the entire reason we're doing this is just to present, hey, what about this? And that's what I'm doing. So if you have questions, you can text to that or you can just raise your hand if you're here. I'll go over a few things that we talked about last time. This has always been a very interesting scripture to me in Hosea. My people are destroyed. God, ostensibly talking, my people are destroyed. Why? Because of lack of knowledge. Now, most of the time when bad things happen or we don't get what we pray for or just different things in our life we don't understand, our first step in our thinking, people will always ask why and what they mean by why. And for example, I, I have a, um, I guess he's a friend. He's a former brother-in-law. I don't know what classification that is in, category, a former brother-in-law that my kids still call uncle. So he's uncle, Uncle Oscar. His brother's son was killed in a motorcycle crash. I don't know if Jeannie's here. Was it a motorcycle? But anyway, and so Oscar was talking about, it. he's asking, you know, why would God do this to me? Okay, so our first step almost always in any situation that seems out of order, that's not good, we wanted this, we needed this, but it ended up this. Our first question is, why would God? And so one of the things that I'm doing in talking about this is to consider that that's never the question, ever, is why would God, 
Here's God saying, my people are destroyed. Why? For lack of knowledge. Uh, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me, another translation says. So this is what I always say because in my word of faith experience, one of the bad things is there seemed to be a lot of judgment about how much faith do you have. And it became a hierarchy of good things are happening to me. And this is the, the tenor, if you will, of the Old Testament. If you do good things, good things happen to you. It's why the Pharisees, when Jesus said things like, you know, it's hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of God, they had a hard time with that. The rich young ruler comes and says, you know, I've done everything. What else can I do? Well, go sell everything you have and give it away. Oh, uh, I can't do that because to them they associated God blesses me when I do good things. And so that sort of became to me in the churches I attended, it was your level of faith or your level of goodness. Maybe there's, there's always, well, there's sin in your life, something like that. Um, I know when my, see, I had an older brother that died um, on my birthday. But I wasn't there. I wasn't born until three years later, but right on my birthday. And just from hearing different things, and maybe Sandy knows more, she was just a wee, a wee lad herself. She would have been five, not quite five, when he died. But my understanding from just hearing rumblings is, you know, the implication is, well, maybe you've done something wrong. You must have done something wrong, and God did this. Or there's always the God needed an angel. He took him. But that is not at all what I'm saying. But this is what I'm always asking. I'm always asking myself, what if there's something I don't know? What if there's something I don't know? And this is really important. Just because God wants something to happen, and I've, I've gone from this from a lot of different angles, just because God wants something to happen is no indication that it will happen or that it's automatic. The guy that started the Bible school that I went to, he would say it this way. He was an old guy. He was an old guy then. He's so old now he's dead. Um, but he would say, it doesn't fall on you like ripe cherries off a tree. Now to me, I would understand ripe apples off a tree because we had an apple tree in the yard growing up. But it's not just, well, if God wants it, it happens. So what if there's something I don't know? What if there's something I'm not implementing? Now, I've shared some of these scriptures before. I even talked about this last time, but I want to actually, I didn't have it, the verses last time. The principles I'm trying to show is Jesus said certain things, and I call it partnership. That's why I don't, I don't necessarily even like the word faith because it has a, a connotation now that's negative with some people. But it is faith. Jesus talked about faith all the time. Um, he would say, according to your faith, let it be unto you. Many, many times. 19, I say this all the time, 19 individual cases that we know that Jesus healed someone. We also know that every time that someone approached Jesus wanting to be healed, they were healed. 100%. He's batting a thousand. He never said, well, in this case, I don't want to. It's not God's will. But in 12 of those 19 cases, their faith is mentioned in some way as a determining factor. Here is where it takes so long to say all these things, but, and I'm always wanting to get to a certain point, but it's not transactional, though. This is so hard for, for me to get, so it has to be hard for everyone else, too. It's not transactional. This is where I, the more I've got into just, just let me look at who Jesus is. How did he interact with God? Jesus was not praying ever because, oh my God, I'm in this situation, or oh my me, I'm in this situation, and I've, I've got to, okay, where's my Bible? What, what is that verse? I know they preach, do you know what I mean? Jesus lived, he said, everything I do is for God's will. He was partnered with God all the time. It was relational. It's, it's like a good marriage where it's not, well, I took out the trash, so you need to, whatever, fill in the blank. It's simply, I love this person. Are we feeling guilty here, Eric? Is there something going on? We can stop and do a little marriage counseling. I'm no good at it at all. Um, 
it's relational where I, I'm simply in love with this person, this person is in love with me. I'm not wondering what this person wants to do. I'm not wondering what this person's character or this person's disposition, what they would do in this situation. I'm not wondering at all. I'm in partnership with this person. Whatever they want, they can have. Whatever they have, I can have. It's not a demand in the sense that I did this, now you do this. It's simply the way the relationship works. I don't know if that makes sense. But here is, um, you know the story of where Jesus went up on to the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he was transfigured. I would love to talk about that story. It's one of my favorite things. They're all one of my favorite things, though, and that's the problem. That's why we're here so long. But as they went back down the mountain, he told them, don't tell anybody what, you saw, what you've seen until the Son and has risen from the dead. When they returned to the other disciples, so Jesus has said, okay, you nine folks, we're going up to the mountain. You stay here, hold down the fort. While they're gone, obviously... Something has been stirring here on the, at the bottom of the mountain. As they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them, and some teachers of religious law were arguing with them. Okay, so that's cool. We have a religious, I can't imagine that ever happening, like today, where religious people would argue about stuff. But here they were. When the crowd saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with awe. I won't stop and talk about it. And they ran to greet him. So there's argument, oh, there's Jesus. Okay, forget you guys, there's Jesus. What is all this arguing about? Jesus asked. I always stop and say, why did Jesus ask what all this arguing was about? Because he didn't know. <laughs> He's a human being. And this is really, really important. So important, if you were here last time. <laughs> to realize Jesus is demonstrating in everything he does what God is like. He's 100% God. Yet, at the same time, he's demonstrating what a human being operating in partnership with God looks like. He doesn't have special Jesus-y powers that are unavailable to us. It bothers me just like it bothers everybody else. But I didn't say that. Okay, we've talked about that before. What's all this arguing about? One of the men in the crowd spoke up and said, Teacher, I brought my son so you could heal him. He's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. Then he foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast out the evil spirit, but they couldn't do it. Now let's stop. Why couldn't the disciples do it? At this point in the story, I mean, what do you think? <laughs> well, actually, we'll talk. I don't want to stop and talk about that. You always bring up things that I would really love to talk about, but I don't have time to talk about. Now, I was going to, I was going to skip something today, but I'm going to because you're here. Because of something you asked six weeks ago. There you go. But do they have the ability in general? What? How do we know that? They went on a boat two by two, she said. No. Jesus sent them out two by two, and they, I'm conflating my stories. They went out on a boat and destroyed the whole world. No, that's not it. Do what? That's right. They've been out healing people and casting out demons, having a wonderful time. Okay, right? Having a wonderful time. Do you know, were you thinking of the same song? I'm sorry, I was too. So they're doing all that. Now they've faced a challenge here where, okay, we prayed for this child. This is what I always bring up, and you're tired of me bringing it up, I'm sure. And you're like, why am I saying this over, over again? Because I want us to get it. Here's the child, demon child, right here. Ah, demons. So. They lay hands on the demon child. <laughs> At this point, we know that, according to the boy, they couldn't do it. Okay? Is it, this is what I want to know, this is step one of everything. Is it God's will 
for this boy to be delivered of whatever the malady is. Yet, people who have been directly commissioned by Jesus, directly commissioned. It's not like they read the Bible, oh, I can do that. No, he looked him in the eye, lays hands on him, go do that. They've done it. So people have prayed and nothing has happened. Is praying and nothing happened indicative of God's will? No. Now that's hard, especially when you're in the situation. But this is everything. It's not everything, but it's number one. It's this first step, okay? I'm going to put the demon child back in front of you. Well, let's keep him here. You never know when we may need him again. Jesus said to them, you know, that's all right. <sighs> you're just not me. If only where you were me, it would be better. No, Jesus gets frustrated. You faithless people. And here's where I want us, I want us to get this so, so badly. Does Jesus still love all those people? Yes. He's simply frustrated with the fact that I'm going to be leaving here pretty soon and you're still not getting it. You're still missing the cutoff man. Yeah, that's one of my favorite lines from <laughs> what is A League of Their Own. <laughs> you remember the scene? You got to go watch A League of Their Own tonight. But they're still missing it. <laughs> <laughs> so much of what I'm trying to teach things, it's just for me. Um, so Jesus said, you faithless people. Jesus has seemed to indicate there's something to do with faith here. Well, what would it have to do with faith? How long must I be with you? How long is this going to take? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Okay. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. And he fell to the ground. <laughs> what are those things? Writhing and foaming at the mouth. What are those things? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what is a seizure? <laughs> Do what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something you can see that seems to be contradictory to what you just prayed for. Right? They prayed, come out of him. They're expecting, oh, he comes out of him. But instead, he does this. It happened to the disciple too. The disciples too. See, this, this didn't just happen with Jesus. Jesus hasn't prayed for him yet. But this is going on. Analyze this. I've always, that's why I love this story. Okay? Jesus is just sort of, you know, he showed up on the scene Oh, you faithless people. Bring him to me. And he brings him to him, and all of a sudden, it ain't looking good for Jesus either. But let's see how Jesus handles a situation where the circumstances and things he can see are different than what the result needs to be. This is what he does. So you're going to be the child since I took the child away from you. They brought him, and he does this. Jesus goes, Oh my gosh, in the name of me. Nope. He goes, he's, he's not impressed. Can you see it? When I read the four Gospels, I'm there. I can see how unimpressed he is. How long has this been happening? <laughs> he's like he was studying his lines tonight. Sit, last night. Since he was a boy. There's so many things here that I want. There, there are principles. There's how this partnership works. There's what happens when it seems like it's not working. Jesus is showing, number one, I'm not, I'm not impressed by this. That's one thing that I love about Jesus. It's one thing that I do not like about the churches I grew up in. Because I've been in situations where it seemed to me like there was a demon present. Or have you ever experienced this in church? We used to have people would stand up and they would we would maybe have a prayer time. Does anybody have a prayer request? And there were the usual, I have an unspoken request. We have an unspoken answer. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that works. But they would say something, you know, I've been feeling a little bit under the weather. This week, would you all lift me up in prayer? And so maybe we'd pray, Lord, help Bertha not to feel under the weather this week. 
But then someone would say, and maybe you've even experienced this when something really, really hard is going on, people would say, I just found out that my nephew has terminal cancer and he was in a car crash and broke his leg. By the way, I just read this thing last night. This is random. Uh, about this baseball game where this guy hit a foul ball and it hit the lady, no, in her jaw, hit the lady in the face and broke her jaw. And so they pause the game and the medics are taking care of her or whatever and they're carrying her off on a stretcher. The very next pitch, he hit another foul ball and hit her in the leg on the stretcher and broke her leg. I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> Like, bless your heart, just go home, <laughs> stay there. <laughs> For real, yeah. It was after, I'd seen this video of, of a guy, in a similar situation, this has nothing to do with Jesus, where the guy hit a foul ball down the left field line, and the guy caught it. It was almost a home run. Yay, I caught the ball. The very next pitch, he hit it down the left field line again, and the same guy caught it. And so they were saying, well, the chances. And then they tell the story about the lady that broke her jaw, that broke her leg as she was on the stretcher. Now, why did I start talking about that? Oh, when really bad things happen, like, oh my gosh, he had a car. When people pray then, for those of you that have been in church, what was the difference? They got louder. What else? Do what? It's collective. Everybody got involved. No, they prayed louder. Main thing I was after, they prayed louder and they prayed longer. Oh, Lord, we beseech you. This nephew, his life is being taken away. Well, we didn't pray about Bertha like that. There's not faith there, it's works. If, when there's something bad, people will put out a thing, let's get a bunch of people praying for it. Even though Jesus plainly says, don't be like the Pharisees, they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. But well, we still think we'll be heard for our much speaking. What can we do? Well, we can get everybody to pray. I mean, fine, but why? Is there something about the way those people pray that is better? Because here I have a situation where people that were personally commissioned by Jesus have prayed and nothing's happening. It's looking bad. <laughs> Keep in mind, I'm not mad at anybody. I'm bringing, hey, how about this? So Jesus says... How long has this been? Jesus, in almost every situation, I don't, I've talked a little bit about the other situations, I just don't want to talk about it today. Over and over and over again, he asked questions before he either spits on their eyes or lays hands on them or says something else. He, there's an interaction that happens. The leper comes down kneels before him, Lord, if you can, I know you will. There's an interaction. I will be healed. The centurion, my son is at home. I'll come and heal him. Oh, no, no, no. Just speak the word only and my servant will be healed. There's a location of what do they believe. There's a partnership. Get rid of the idea that God can do whatever he wants whenever he wants. He's always looking for partnership. Jesus is looking for partnership here. And especially every time he ministered to a child, he always got the permission of the parents. The only time, and I don't believe the child, I, I think he was probably 30 years old. The only other time, the child was dead. And he raised him from the dead. But it wasn't a child. I, it was the widow's only son. Sorry, I always like to be thorough. <laughs> but he always, he would ask for you're seeking partnership with the parent. Now look, since he was a little boy, spirit often throws him into the fire and the water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. And this strikes a nerve with Jesus. What Jesus said reveals a lot because we often kind of pray like that, if you can. And we're not even sure if God can, 
But we're not even sure if he wills. This is why I always talk about faith begins where the will of God is known. Jesus responds, now there are two, I don't know if you're interested in stuff like this, there are two different ways that people interpret this passage. This is the New Living Translation where Jesus says, what do you mean if I can? If I can? You're questioning my ability here? Anything is possible if a person believes. There's that word believes again. The father instantly cried, I do believe, but help me overcome my belief. The new revised standard version, updated edition, <laughs> if you want to know the best translation that's the most accurate with the original text, it's the new revised standard version, and now the updated edition. It's not like they changed their mind on anything. There's just more scholarship and it's a little more accurate. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. Here's the father. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us, help us. And Jesus said to him, if you are able. Here the man has said, if you are able. And Jesus is saying, if you are able. Now you don't like that. <laughs> Most people don't like that. It should simply be up to God. Jesus is demonstrating. He's showing who God is. And he's demonstrating how partnership with God works. If you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. So this to me makes me go, okay, I need to figure out what he means by believes. What does he mean by believes? Because if all things can be done for him who believes, then I want to be a person who believes. And I don't argue with him saying, but I am believing. But I do say, many times now, I do believe, but can you help me? Is there something I don't know? Help me with my unbelief. That's why I say to him all the time. When Jesus saw the crowd of onlookers who was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit that makes this um, uh, boy unable to speak and hear, uh, or hear and speak. I command you to come out of this child and never enter him again. I'd like to talk about that last part, but we don't have time. Then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion. What is this right here? Remember? What is this? It's stuff you can see. I will use a word, and it's become, a, it's be, it's become used differently in our modern context. Manifestation. Manifestation is what trips up everybody when it comes to interaction and partnership with God. And it's not about manifesting your dreams. I'm not talking about that. It's just manifest means to make visible, something you can see. We're getting a good picture of what tripped the disciples up. Jesus says, come out of this boy. Don't come into him again. And immediately there is a reaction. There's a manifestation. The situation just got worse. The disciples inside are going, oh no. This, this manifestation seems to be even worse. Convulsion and left him. The boy appeared to be dead. A murmur ran through the crowd. Can you hear it? Just listen. Murmur, murmur, murmur. As people said, he's dead. <laughs> I just can't imagine you at church. Oh, I thought this guy was good, but okay, he's killed a kid. This can't be good. This is not, this is going to ruin the tour if you know anything about the Justin Timberlake thing. He's dead. <laughs> Jesus, this is what I want you to see. I'm not saying this is, this is a total change in mindset. This comes from a person who's in relationship with his heavenly father all the time. This is an emergency situation. And for the last six months, all he's been doing is eating donuts and watching Downton Abbey. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'd like you to notice I pronounced it correctly. I've never seen it in my entire life. Anyway, people are crazy about it. What do you think the most beloved series ever is? What's the best series ever? Is it The Sopranos? Is it, is it Walt? What is Walt? A Breaking Bad? What is the best one, you think? Seinfeld? John, I hate to break it to you, but you and I are old. I don't think that's it. 
<laughs> part of what? <laughs> oh, I guess I see what you're saying. It's part of ever. Well, if we're going to do that, it has to be mash. But so anyway, you know, your focus all of a sudden now is, oh my gosh, now what do I do? No, uh, that's why, and this is where I hate to say this. I hate to say this, but I want people to know this. There was a, there was a guy named Smith Wigglesworth, unfortunately, that was his name. It sounds like he was like a cat or something, Mr. Wigglesworth. And he made this statement, and he lived around the turn of the century, and, you know, there's not a lot of evidence, but ministered very similar to Jesus in many ways, and supposedly documented cases that 21 people he raised from the dead. Again, the guy that I went to, that founded the Bible school, when he would tell that story, he would always say, he's got me beat by 21. So... <laughs> Um, but he said, don't wait till you need faith to get faith. Now, here's the thing. How do I explain this? In, in, in the word of faith camp, to me, there was too much emphasis on my faith. And it became a work. It became a judgment. That's why I'm constantly saying Jesus was just in relationship, partnership with God. It's just as natural as breathing. He didn't have a single thought in his mind that, you know, I bet this time he doesn't want this boy healed. Not at all. That's why I'm taking time to emphasize this. The first step is faith begins where what's God's will? It doesn't matter what I see. It doesn't matter what I experience. It doesn't matter what I feel. And I'm not going to make statements. Even if it doesn't, I'll still serve it. Even if it doesn't. You remember you asked about the... We're going to talk about that, maybe. But so this happens. He's dead. Jesus is unimpressed. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. Okay? Jesus is unimpressed by what he sees. Now, okay, stick with me. I posted this the other, night, other day, and this helps me. It may not help anyone else. This is something that reveals a trait about Christians that I'm hoping will lead us to something positive. This, what I'm about to show you, is also something my mother saw that helped her to believe God for something physical that she had to see. And it's helped me a lot. I've let it go because of the weirdness of the people I was at. But this is a very famous scripture. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Very famous scripture, Baptists, Pentecostals, we all agree, we preach this. And what will happen, and here, let me, this, the mathematician, the mathematician, the mathematician in me, the engineer, that showed you how good a mathematician I am. When I see this, my brain goes, okay, one, declare that Jesus is Lord. Check. Two, believe God raised him. Three, salvation will be yours. Now, in the churches I grew up in, people would, okay, I want to be a Christian. Okay, pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we would always start with Heavenly Father. It's nowhere in the Bible to ever start a prayer for salvation with Heavenly Father, but we do that. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We come to you in the name of Jesus. Sometimes you get confused. Bless the hands that prepared this. Oh, that's my own prayer. But anyway, so you pray this prayer. And then people would pray that. And they might say, in that moment, they might say, I don't feel any different. And we would say things like, it doesn't matter what you feel. We would see them two weeks later. I don't feel any different. In fact, I kind of feel worse. The bad part is you had the testimonies of people that would say, that I was on an alt in the altar and I prayed that prayer and it was like a two-ton weight lifted off my chest and the heavens opened. I heard birds singing and saw rainbows. And you always felt guilty because I didn't feel anything. But the Baptists and the Pentecostals and some Methodists and Presbyterians would say, it doesn't matter. Do you believe Jesus is Lord? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you believe God's inspiration from the dead? Yes. According to the word of God, no matter what you feel, you're saved. Okay. Everybody believes that. Everybody. The problem is when a guy comes, like me comes along and goes, okay, here's Jesus. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, 
believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And my brain goes, number one, declare what you want. Just like declare Jesus as Lord. Check. Believe God granted it. Exactly like believe God raised him from the dead. Check. It will be yours. You will be saved. Well, no. And then when you, when you say to them, I prayed, and I don't feel any different. It doesn't look this group. They start doing the things that I always make fun of. Well, you know, sometimes God wants to do something in you before he wants to do something for you. Maybe God is saying, wait a while. Maybe there's unrepentant sin in your life. Why don't we say that with the other one? Because we're hypocrites. That's why. <laughs> it's no big thing. Christians are hypocrites. They always tell me that I'm picking and choosing. Everybody picks and chooses, number one. But they've chosen this one is true. No matter what I see or feel, the Word of God says. And when they come to this one, they're depending, again, on this word, manifestation. Well, I don't look any different than I did. I accepted Jesus. I said, Lord, I don't feel any different. Nothing's changed in my life. I know. But something has happened on the inside. If you'll hang on to that, something will change on the outside. Over here, believe God granted it, it will be yours. What is the main trouble with prayer and receiving prayer? We don't believe that. We just don't believe that. Another uh, illustration of this happened last night when I posted something on Stonebrook's thing about today. I simply said, this is all I said. I, I didn't post a scripture, but I'll read the scripture. Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. Now see, number one, I'm not criticizing you watching. I'm talking with me. Ask and it will be given to you. You and I do not believe that. We don't believe that. We believe all kinds of other things that we talk about. It's in the Bible, this is what I believe. But when I simply say that, ask and it will be given you, you don't believe that. There's things in your brain that you're mounting a resistance and an explanation with other things that you simply don't. Jesus believed, when I ask, it will be given to me. I don't care if the boy flips over and does cartwheels and foams at the mouth. Things come out of his mouth, things come out of his butt. I don't care. Ask, it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find, knock on the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, those who seek find, those who knock, the door will be open. Then he goes on, and I talked about this last time, which of your father will give a stone? But I just posted on Stonebrook, Jesus said, ask and you'll get it. Is this true? And this person is not evil. The person simply responded, he didn't say well, but in his mind he was saying well. <laughs> well... That's a tiny, he used the word tiny. You can't just, use, just look at that tiny verse when that's part of a whole complex context of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? Now here, you be the judge. Maybe I'm wrong. When you post, if you post on Facebook, because that's what life is all about, posting on social media. If you post, I like social media and I hate it. Because he's right. Number one, there's a much more complex context of the Sermon on the Mount. Got it. But if I would have posted, and I commented this back, if I would have posted, this is from the Sermon on the Mount, what I'm about to share. It's something that Congress is always seeming to want to put the Sermon on the Mount on the wall or something. Oh, no. Well, that's the Ten Commandments. Sorry. Um, something Paul called the Ministry of Death. Hey, let's put that on the wall. But... <laughs> There will be posts forthcoming, especially the one where Oklahoma is requiring people to teach the Bible. Like, I'm not upset about that. I'm thinking of quitting everything I'm doing and going to Oklahoma to be a teacher. Because what an opportunity. <laughs> I mean, I can teach the Bible just exactly like the one, especially the one where the genitalia of donkeys is admired and then the ejaculation of horses is what they're... I mean, I, may have, I have to do illustrations for the kids. Anyway, they don't want the Bible taught. This, I mean, I'm getting off the subject, but they don't want the Bible talk. Well, what was I talking about? Oh, if I would have posted, here's where Jesus said, if a man looks on a woman to lust, he's committed adultery already. 
if you post that in general on Facebook and Christians see it, what will be the comments? Amen. Will they ever say, now, that's a tiny verse in a more complex context of the entire Sermon on the Mount. You can't just post that. Never. I mean never in the history of humanity. I may, I may just randomly attempt it from time to time. Amen. That's right. You've got to preach the Bible like it is. But if I say, ask, and it will be given you, now, now, see, there you are taking things out of context again. There you are picking and choosing. I'm just, this is the Bible. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just pointing out that we have been taught in church a disposition to believe certain things absolutely and to question other things. I think we should question everything. But when Jesus says to me, ask and it will be given, my default position now is, okay, yes. That is the first step to understand when receiving anything from God is when I ask, how do you know your prayer is answered? I asked, but it didn't happen. Okay, now we can have a conversation about that if you want. But God gave it. Now I want to illustrate that. And if you don't mind, take time just to stretch out. Let's stand up for a second because I'm going to answer. I think it's 154. Let's go to 154, Sarah. Okay. Sarah, I. I always remember the time where a person had posted this certain thing and I simply posted about 17 other verses that seemed to contradict what this person. And their response was, you're always picking these obscure verses. And this is something where I'm like, okay, this is a new concept to me. Obscure verses, it's something I'm well aware of. Again, the guy that formed the Bible school that I went to he says, Christians have a little rabbit trail that they run down through the Bible. If you're watching and you don't know what a rabbit trail is, it's a trail upon which rabbits frequent. They made it. It's not like put up a sign, rabbit crossing. Maybe we should move the sign. Rabbits are getting hit. But anyway, this little section. And so there are verses that Christians will string together to create a dogma. If you're not following Daniel McClellan on Instagram or Facebook, you need to. He's always talking about dogma, data over dogma. Christians form a dogma, then go to the scripture to support that dogma with various verses instead of letting the Bible be what the Bible is. But I'm sure there's part of that as well. Okay. Mark asked a question that we'll answer if we have time. And if we all get bored, then Mark can stay and we'll talk about it. Um, this... Because here's the, here's the question, and I was sort of waiting on Brian to return, but he may have left, he may have left for the day. He's like every banker I ever call. Oh, he stepped out for the day. So, the, one of the hardest things, to me anyway, this is the most difficult thing, and it has to do with this word, manifest. Manifesting, manifestation, is especially like Mark eleven twenty four. Let me quote it from the King James Bible. Jesus said, whatever you desire, Old English desire means to ask, but I think it's all right if it's just a desire too. But whatever you desire, when you pray, when is, by the way, when you pray, when is that? But when would that be? Now. When you pray means now. Believe that you receive it. Or Amplify says, believe it's been granted. And this is, what, this is what I'm working on now and what I want us to work on. It's changing our picture of God from trying to talk him into something, if I get enough people talking, if I pray long enough, if I am good enough, is here's God on his throne. He doesn't actually sit on a throne. That's a whole other discussion. But this is me approaching God. That's me out there. I need this. 
And I've already discussed, does God have that? Is this something God can do? Is this something God wants to do? I'm convinced. And so I'm now, I'm requesting that. What God does is this. Okay. Okay. This is the position of God. Now, again, I'm saying this to make, to make us all think. You don't think about God like that. You don't see him like that. You don't see God as, I hope they ask, because I'm going to give them this. <laughs> uh, can I have that? Yes. Okay. Jesus said, when you pray, believe it's been granted. When? Now. When you pray is always now. Where? How about that? We'll talk about this for a second. Where? Where is God? Where is he? We're in a courtroom. Sir, can you please point out the, per the perpetrator? <laughs> where is God? Okay, where is that? God has to be in some other, let's use the word, realm, dimension. He's everywhere. I can't escape him. But when you pray, when I'm asking, I'm asking someone that I can't see, right? <laughs> so he's not there. He's not right there. He's not in a place that I can see. He's not manifested. So believe that I receive when? Now. Where? Wherever God is, he is sent it. Then Jesus said, and you shall, what is the word shall? When is that? He, he's, you shall, that means at some other point, that's not necessarily now. <laughs> you shall, but it also is indicative of absolutely, this will happen. But it's not now. When? Somewhere in the future. Have it. Where? In my hand. In my hand. Where I can see it. I'm asking someone I can't see. And Jesus said, when you ask it, ask and it'll be given to you. When? Right now. Where? Wherever God is. He's, he went, there you go. This is a, we've talked about this before, but I just want to set what I'm about to show up. And you shall, when? Sometime in the future. Receive it. Where? Where I can see it. Daniel, I'm not going to go into the historicity of this. Can you just let me talk? I'm just going to let me talk about it. You guys are fine with that. I'm just letting everyone know. There's a lot about Daniel I would love to talk about, but I can't. He said this. Daniel had a, a deal where he saw in the book of Jeremiah, hey, we're only supposed to be in Babylon about 70 years. And hey, it's getting close. So... Daniel has found the will of God. You guys are going to be in exile about 70 years. He's discovered that in his version of the Bible. Oh, so he begins praying and confessing the sins of Israel. Oh, our God, hear your servant's prayer. Listen as I plead. For your own sake, Lord, smile again on your desolate sanctuary. But anyway, I went on praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people pleading with the Lord my God for Jerusalem, his holy mountain. You understand, Daniel's in Babylon. He wants us to go back to Israel. Watch this. This helps. Just give me a few more minutes. Change your life. Is that the actual time in the bottom corner? That is so cool. That's very helpful. I can override this clock by this clock. <laughs> as I was praying. When is as I was praying? Right now, as I was praying, Gabriel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly. This is the picture I want you to see of God. Daniel's praying for something, and God said, go, go, Gabriel, go, go, go. It's just like air, air troopers or whatever going out the door. Go, go, go. And so Abel, Gabriel came quickly to me at the time of the evening's Sacrifice, and Gabriel drops some really good wisdom here. He explained to me, Daniel, Daniel, I've come here to give you insight and understanding. The moment you 
began praying. This is, this is change of mindset, change of attitude about partnership with God. When is the moment you began praying? It's right now. A command was given. And now I am here. You couldn't see me. You gave a command. And now you can see me. I'm here. Now this is what I like. I like this type of prayer. <laughs> I need four million dollars. There you go. Okay, thanks. <laughs> anyway, I'm here to tell you and he gave him understanding concerning the vision. Okay? So, if this is all we read, that sounds really great. And here you have SpongeBob a few moments later. In the third year, it's actually a couple years later. One chapter later. In the third year of the reign of King Cyrus, I had another vision. Daniel's having these visions. I under, he understood the vision, concerned things that would happen in the future. When the vision came to me, I, Daniel, and this says had been, again, New Revised Standard Version. I, Daniel, was mourning for three whole weeks. What does mourning mean? All that time I had eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips. I used no fragrant lotions. I didn't take a bath until those three weeks had passed. Daniel has this vision and he begins to pray and ask God about what the heck does this mean? And so he fasts along the way. He does a Daniel fast. He just heard about that from James River. And so he did a Daniel fast. And on April 23rd, I love the NLT. It wants to give an exact date. Uh, well, it says the, in King James would be the something day of the month of Abib or something. You understand there were, let's don't talk about the Hebrew months, I'll get distracted. On April 23rd, as I was standing on the bank of the great Tigris River, I looked up and saw a man dressed in linen clothing with a belt of pure gold around his waist. His body, all these things, and so here's this dude comes up. Only I, Daniel, saw the vision. The men with me saw nothing, but they were suddenly terrified and ran away to hide. So I was left there all alone to see this amazing vision. My strength left me, fell down, I was weak. The man said to me, Daniel, you're very precious to God, so listen carefully to what I'm saying. Stand up, for I've been sent to you. This has been three weeks, and now he's been sent. Or has he? When he said this, I stood up trembling. He said, don't be afraid, Daniel. Since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before your God. This is how I know he was praying. Because this angel guy says he was praying. The first day you began, your request has been heard in heaven. So when I ask God for something, when does he hear me? Right now. And I have come in answer to your prayer. But for 21 days, how long has Daniel been praying? 21 days. I wish the Bible wouldn't do this. Pick one. Call it three weeks. Call it 21 days. Stop going back and forth. It's just a little thing that bothers me. 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. I don't make the rules. <laughs> There is, in this earth, an opposition in various ways to the things that God wants to happen. This, in Daniel's case, Daniel 9, I prayed, oh, there's Gabriel. Daniel 10, I prayed, he still sent at the same time. But there's a force that's opposing the answer to this particular prayer. And for 21 days, there is, in one sense, a battle going on. Now, people take these things to the extreme, and that's why I don't talk about them much. But Paul, in Ephesians, if Paul wrote Ephesians, said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, powers, uh, wicked spirits in the heavenly places. You have a question? This is not a vision that's being had right here. Except Paul, Daniel is seeing it. The other people aren't seeing it. 
but they're sensing there's something weird here and they ran away. So in that sense, yes. But it is something, and I like that you use that word, vision. He can see it. He couldn't see it for three weeks. Do you know what I mean? The answer that he's after is now here after three weeks. But during that three weeks period, there was opposition to what was happening. Then Michael, one of the archangels, came to help me, and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. The picture is sort of, okay, I'm Gabriel, or whoever this guy is, and I'm bringing a message, and oh, there's a big bad guy here that does not want me to get there. So I fight with him for a while, and Michael, in heaven, is like, oh, I gave you kung fu lessons, and you still don't know. So Michael comes down, and he says, go on and take the message, I'll deal with this guy. You see that? This is what I believe. And then here's that word. Now, now, I'm here. I wasn't here three weeks ago. But it's not because God didn't want me here. God wanted me to be here three weeks ago. The moment that you prayed, God went, go. It's granted. But I'm here now. But I wasn't here for three weeks. But it's not because God didn't grant it. It did not show up where you could see it or hear it. But now I'm here, and here's the reason I was delayed. When it comes, do you have another question? <laughs> Go ahead. You are, you are doing what I like that you do. You are questioning the validity, validity of the story. I'm using the story to illustrate an explanation of now, versus later. Does that make sense? That doesn't help you yeah, probably at all. <laughs> well, that may still happen. I can't guarantee that. <laughs> but yeah, I, I understand. I understand. But it's just like, do you understand what she's saying? She's questioning, well, nobody else saw it, so how can we, which I love that. But here's another story. We have a very similar story in Acts chapter 9. And this is where, if you have learned anything, you can stay. If you haven't, you can go. Or if you need to go, you can go. We'll dismiss in prayer. Lord, bless and keep them as they go. Give them traveling mercies. I pray a hedge of protection around them as they go. Um, so you're welcome to leave, because I will talk about this just a little. These are things that fascinate me. Because I would like to talk about visions and revelations. There are actually three different types of visions and there's three different types of revelations. The highest form of vision is an open vision where you actually see your eyes are open and you can see a person. I'm trying to think of an example right now. I didn't study on this at the moment. <laughs> like on the way here? <laughs> well, hang on, on hallucination. The Bible talks about visions in different ways. Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, okay. Here's an open vision. Peter is in jail, and an angel delivers him, leads him through the town. He's physically walking, following someone he can physically see. We don't have other corroboration except for the fact that the story is told, and he's talking to these other people, and they know, well, Peter was in jail. And the next morning, they go to look for Peter, and he's not in jail, and the doors are still locked. Okay, but that's an open vision. He's seeing him with his eyes. I'm trying to think of an open vision. Now you're getting me distracted. Where multiple people see. Anyway, but there is also, like Paul. That would be... But that would, to me, that's a physical manifestation. Now, see, I love this. I, we're totally off the subject. Forget this. Forget whatever we taught. I hope you learned something. There's sometimes a time period between believe you receive it and you have it, and there's opposition, and we can talk another time about what to do about that. What Daniel did is he stayed with it for three weeks. It is his persistence that gave the authority and the partnership for Michael to say, I got to do something about this. He's not giving up. Okay? End of story. The angels they saw, to me, was an actual physical manifestation. Paul, 
I believe it's Paul. Paul said, be, be um, the word's not careful, be mindful to entertain strangers. Because by, by this, some of you have entertained angels unaware. That means the angel, and see, this is where you can all leave. Really, it's, it's okay to leave. <sighs> we'll get back to yours, but now I'm distracted. This means then that somehow an angel could take on or be seen physically. There's this guy I saw, well, maybe that was an angel. The story in 2 Kings chapter 6 where Elisha and Gehazi are at Dothan. And uh, Gehazi goes out to get water in the morning and, oh my gosh, master, what shall we do? Because the mountain, there was all kinds of Syrian forces around them. What are we going to do? Elisha says, there's more with us than there are with them. Well, they could not be seen. And it never says that Elisha saw them. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes that he may see. And suddenly he saw chariots of fire. Chariots of fire around the, around Elisha. If you're young, you don't know what I just did. But um, that is still, to me, a spiritual vision. And it's interesting that he says, open his eyes. Because Paul is on the road to Damascus. Remind me to talk about, okay, there, there's not a vision. You can actually see him and touch him. But Paul's on the road to Damascus. It doesn't say he was on a donkey or a horse. But people always say, God knocked him off his horse. A horse is not mentioned in this scene. But he's knocked to the ground. He sees a bright light. He tells the story two more times. But this is Luke telling the original story. And he falls to the ground. He hears a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. That's something when I was a kid in school. I would, they're saying pricks in church. But anyway, it's King James. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. The NIV came along and all the preachers were like, Whew, we can just say goats now. It's a lot better. But then when Paul told the story, he said, I was knocked to the ground. And when I opened my eyes, I couldn't see anything. He also says that he saw Jesus. So he had a vision of Jesus with his eyes closed. That's a spiritual vision. Okay? Didn't actually see him, but he could touch him. But now Paul says you can see angels unaware. Okay, this is weird. Is there actually a different realm where God and people who have died, for example, are? Or, because I've always asked, my wife asks this all the time, since we, were, we weren't shorter, why am I doing this? Younger. <laughs> we were thinner. <laughs> Maybe I should do this <laughs> when we were younger. Um, she said, well, what is the purpose of this physical world if we're just going to live in heaven? I mean, why do this? It seems like a lot of trouble to go to because people would just say, you know, you're just going to be here for 70 years or whatever. I'm going to be here for 100 or so. Maybe. I have to decide. After about 100, we'll talk. How old are you? So I'm 58. So when I'm 92, we'll talk. By the way, you know, people talk about with the presidential election. <laughs> Let's get on that subject. You know, they're both too old. Not necessarily. Warren Buffett's 93, and I'd vote for him in a heartbeat. Anyway, so let's move on. What were we talking about? Paul seeing the vision. Why am I talking about 102? Oh, what is this physical world for? What if, just asking a question, what if everything is the same? It's just on a spectrum. And here's where I get to talk about quantum physics. And you can just roll your eyes and ignore me. The theory of relativity says the closer any object gets to the speed of light. Light, by the way, doesn't have mass. Everything, this is a basic law of physics, anything that has mass always doesn't have mass, sorry, doesn't have mass, always travels at the speed of light. Things that have mass can never travel at the speed of light. That's the basics of physics. Whether or not that's completely true, but that's the theory of general relativity. 
But the, f the closer mass gets, let's say that I am mass, which I indeed am, the closer I get to traveling at the speed of light relative to you, let's say you're not traveling at the speed of light, you're just sitting there menacingly. And the closer I get to the speed of light, two things happen to me. Do you know what they are? What? <laughs> Don't disintegrate. The mass will get smaller, will contract. If I'm this long, the closer I get to the speed of light, I will get closer and closer and closer to being this long. Also, for me, relative to you, time slows down. And this is like satellites that are traveling around the Earth at a different distance than us, at a different speed, 17,000 miles per hour, have an adjustment in them for GPS so the times match. Because time is slower for the satellite versus us. Anyway, it's proven empirically and scientifically. But time slows down and I reduce in mass. The closer I get to the speed of light. Also, now, now I'm, we've totally left the Bible. I'm just supposing here. Do you understand that this is not solid? This, this is moving. There is a world, the quantum world, in where everything has molecules and atoms, atoms, let's go down to atoms, that have a nucleus and electrons and protons that are orbiting that nucleus. This is not stationary, it's moving. And there is vastly more space than there is solid, those nuclei, okay? It doesn't appear that way, but it is. If I could align the atoms in my hand with the atoms in this chair, it would be very easy to pass right through it. Because I'm not solid, and this isn't solid. But the atoms that are moving very, very quickly run into the atoms in here that are moving very quickly, quickly and we, it stops me. Okay? What if these atoms begin to move at the speed of light. Well, one thing that would happen is it would disappear relative to me who is not traveling at the speed of light. Okay? It would disappear. If Eric and I get in the car and we drive at the speed of light and we're approaching, oh, we've got to hit that overdrive, and we're about to hit the speed of light, relative to you, we're tiny, 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 and for us, relative to you, time has slowed. Did you see the movie Interstellar? You need to watch, I always think of Render Cellar. Um, Interstellar, where they go down to the planet and they're there for like five minutes and they come back and the guy's aged 20 years. That's because of gravity. That's a, whole other, that's a whole other story that really bothers me, that gravity also slows time. But let's not talk about black holes right now. But relative to you, time to us, we're just sitting here talking, drinking our Cokes, having a good time. Eric's telling me the story about when he saw tigers. To us, we don't appear to be moving quickly. And time hasn't changed at all. But relative to you, time has almost stopped. What if we could, here's the speed of light, what if we could go over past the speed of light? What would happen to us relative to you? We would disappear and time would cease. Does that sound like heaven to you? Jesus may be sitting right there. I may have knocked him completely out of the chair earlier. I don't know. I don't know. See, I'm not asserting anything. I'm simply saying it's always been weird to me. So there's the spirit realm. Like, where is heaven? Is it a planet? It can't be a planet. It's not physical. Is it all around us, somewhere. How did Jesus, he was in Emmaus, and they ran back to Jerusalem, and they locked the door, and they're inside, and Jesus just walks in, or just, hey guys, how did he do that? How did he, in his glorified state, we call it, is there an ability where the angels are simply 
moving at the speed of light. But then they can slow that down and now I can see them. And they're just as physical as this chair is. I tell the story of Daniel to illustrate the opposition. Okay? Here is something that I'm going back to my word of faith days. This is something that's argued a little bit. And I'm, see, I'm fine with, let's discuss this, let's think this through. If, let me, let me try to illustrate it this way. There's a little mark on the floor and I always want my chair to be centered over that. I'm slightly OCD. Um, if, if I tell you, let's think of something that, um, let's use a child maybe. If Caleb, when he's young, and I tell him, tell you what, this Saturday, man, it's been hot out here, but it's supposed to be a, a cool front come through. We're going to go to the zoo this Saturday. Okay? And, or I tell him maybe even two weeks ahead. We're going to go to the zoo here in a couple weeks. That's what I'd like to do. So let's say Caleb a few days later, he makes a request. Now you said you were going to take me to the zoo. So I just want you to know I want to go to the zoo. So I'm asking you to do what you told me you would do. Take me to the zoo. And I say to him, yes, sir. I told you that's what I wanted to do, and I'm going to do that. Does he need to ask me again? Why? There you go. This is the question that's bantied about, bantied? Bantied. About that I think this is kind of what you're asking. Because... Again, I'm just sharing Daniel out of the Old Testament to illustrate the opposition. And it's graphically, oh, there's something happening in a place I can't see that's opposing. That's, that's all I'm illustrating. And that Daniel stuck with, stuck with it. I don't think you need to stick with it asking and praying about it again. This is where relationship comes from. And this is where it's hard and where I talk about partnership because there's also a difference between believing and desperation, which I've seen a lot in my life and other people's life. But if Jesus said, when you pray, believe you'll receive it and you will have it. If I believe that he's granted it to me now, I don't have to ask him and keep on praying for that necessarily. I have to, full disclosure, this is the bad thing about me trying to ever talk about anything. Matthew 7 says in the original Greek, ask and keep on asking. Knock and keep on knocking. Seek and keep on seeking. Okay? But I'm going to set that aside. That's a tiny verse in the full context of the entire Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus said, believe you receive it and you will have it. To me, my posture and my actions from then on are when I think about it, and this is what Caleb should do. Because if Caleb comes up to me the next day, hey, Dad, will you take me to the zoo this Saturday? Well, yeah, I told you I would. It's not Saturday yet. Okay. And the next day, Dad, will you take me to the zoo? I would. Relation. Partnership. Don't you trust me? <laughs> Don't you trust me that I'm going to do this? I'm going to do this. Okay? And this illustration isn't perfect. I'm always thinking of things in my illustrations. Well, this little part of it doesn't fit. <laughs> But this is what I've got at the moment. What would be a better thing for Caleb to do? Hey, Dad, and this, this expresses his faith. I really appreciate that you're, you're taking me to the zoo this Saturday. You believe I'm taking you to the zoo this Saturday? Yes. Caleb now has a trip to the zoo. He hasn't experienced it yet. It hasn't manifested yet. But he has a trip to the zoo. And he needs to not be anxious. That's a very good point. A very good question.